Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Connections with myself, Cameron Bunch, and my father, Dr. Randy Lane Bunch. We're getting started just a minute past when we normally do. Uh, my dad and I were both uh, coming from different parts of town <laughs> to our respective homes, and uh, so uh, we're getting started. But uh, So last week, we kind of talked about the idea of kenosis, which many of you might be like, I have no idea what you just said. Um, <laughs> and that's okay. Um, pretty much the idea of did Jesus empty himself completely in all respects to deity, powers, rights as God to become Jesus. And we get into a lot of depth of what is the technicality of how would you phrase what kenosis is? Where do people decide on different things and where we stand on that? So if you're curious about that at all, or have ever wondered anything about, well, was Jesus fully God? Was he fully man? How did he not have like his like godlike powers, but still did miracles that I don't do? Like, and have all those questions. Go back one week and check it out. It's a great episode, and I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it. This week, we're going to be switching gears quite a bit, as we often do, and mm. we're going to be getting into the idea of revival. Um, and revival is an interesting idea and an interesting topic because uh, I think most people, if you say the word revival, most people's mind goes to the Azusa Street revival because I think it's the most common one in recent history that everyone recognizes. However, I think if you look at the word revive or revival, it's to make live again. And um, so in that respect, it's often meaning uh, in respects to moves of God, of when God's power is more dis displayed prominently in the public eye and in a powerful way. And so we kind of wanted to get into the idea of talking about revival. What is it? Do we believe in it? Um, and what does it look like? Is it something that we orchestrate? Is it something God orchestrates? Can we pull levers and make it happen? Do we need a charismatic leader to bring it about? Do you just need a lot of evangelism? Do you need a lot of people praying? How does revival happen? And so we're just going to start diving into that topic of revival. So let's just kick it out and start opening. All great questions, and they all pertain to the things we're going to be talking about tonight. As you said, revival implies something was alive before. And when we're talking about revival, I think it's important to mention that revival is something the church experiences. The world is impacted by it, but it's something the world, the church experiences. So in other words, you can't revive the world they can come to life through the new birth. They can come into spiritual life through the new birth. But for something to be revived, it has to be vi it has to be vived to begin with. It has to viva, you know, is the word for living or life. So it has to be revived. It has to come to life again. It has to be alive to begin with. And so what we're talking about in revival, we're talking about seasons of God bringing revival, re a new life to the church, refreshing oftentimes restoration. I think there's a good verse of scripture, Cameron, maybe to start with in um, familiar to you and I, maybe because you heard me quote it a lot of times throughout your young life. I, for six years, traveled the road, as you know, doing Holy Ghost meetings with another minister. And it was during a time where the joy of the Lord was being released on the church. Great things were happening. We saw scores of people healed, touched, changed lives, churches, you know, impacted. It was a wonderful time. And one of the verses we used a lot was from Acts 3.19, where Peter's preaching his second great message, the day of Pentecost was the first. Now, this is a, a, a short time later when they raise up the lame man at Gate Beautiful and get a crowd. And he says this in the course of his preaching. He says, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So this idea of times of re refreshing, one, one translation says times of recovery of breath. I like that, because sometimes the church needs to be able to recover its breath and get, you know, a, a, a bit of fresh new life in it. And that's that's kind of the idea there. I'm sorry, I'm folks, I'm not being distracted here. I'm just trying to turn on focus so that I don't get disturbed anymore by messages coming in. Um, but but as I was praying about this, Cameron, and what, what facilitated this um, idea in me was two events that are taking place kind of simultaneously right now. Some of our viewers will have heard of the Asbury um, University Revival. There is a university in Kentucky, I believe it is Asbury Christian College or Christian University, that is experiencing a revival. They began having chapel services one day, I don't know, a few weeks back, a couple weeks back, a week back, I don't remember exactly. I've, ju I've just heard bits and pieces of it. 
And that chapel service just basically turned into an organic, spontaneous move of the Holy Spirit that is still continuing on. I don't think anybody's left the chapel. I mean, people have come and gone, obviously, as they've had to go to class, go to work, use a bathroom, whatever, you know. Um, but but there's been a constant move of God in there since. I've heard that there have been traumatic healings, people saved. And of course, anytime God moves, there are critics or people that look at something and have a different perspective and want to kind of put a dim light on what God is doing. And I think that's exactly what it is. It's a dim light from a dim mind, oftentimes trying to um, obscure what God is doing, simply because God moves through human vessels. Sometimes there's going to be things mixed in with a genuine move of God that are maybe not the ideal. You know, in other words, people can be poor stewards of something God is genuinely doing. Paul even mentions that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 14, when he's talking about a move of the Holy Spirit taking place in the Corinthian church. And he has to give some guidelines. He said, if anyone speaks and says that Jesus is accursed, um, that's not the Holy Spirit, guys. You know, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 3. And he said, but if if it, if if what's going on glorifies Jesus and says Jesus is Lord, any spirit that says Jesus is Lord is of, is of God. Well, and that's kind of a simple acid test. But the point being that if Jesus is being magnified, if souls are being saved, if the kingdom of heaven is being expanded, it's God. And um, if it's not, if it's drawing attention to a man rather than the Lord Jesus Christ, if it's not producing souls being saved, lives being changed, disciples being made, then it's worth taking a look at, you know, through the, a scriptural lens and evaluating whether something profitable is really taking place. I think that's fair. Where The Bible said judge all things, right? But that doesn't mean have a mean, critical spirit either. And so we have to be balanced having a discerning mind with at the same time being um, of ready mind. You know, again, we always use the Bereans, right? Is that wonderful balance where the Bible said they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily to make sure which the things that Paul and Silas said were so. So I think that's good to have a um, a mind that's not gullible, but at the same time, very receptive and open to what the Spirit of God is doing. So one was that Asbury revival that's taking place in that Christian university. And then the other thing is there's a movie being released called Jesus Revolution about the Jesus movement. And that involves two primary character characters, an evangelist named Lonnie Frisbee, who was, I guess you would just have to call him a hippie preacher. He was a hippie preacher back in the 70s. You know, this is Vietnam, right? This is right after the 60s. And this is a turbulent time in America. In fact, it may have even begun in the 60s. But it's primarily in the 70s. I remember a lot of this taking place. This is when the Living Bible became big, you know, and people began reading the Bible because it was something other than the King James. And and these hippies were getting saved, but they had nowhere to go to church. And so, long story short, Chuck Smith, who started Calvary Chapel, opens up his church to Lonnie Frisbee and these crazy hippies, you know. And he thinks he's going to lose his ministry. The, the, the movie looks wonderful. It was um, uh, Kelsey Grammer is in it. Um, the gentleman, um, Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus in The Chosen, is Lonnie Frisbee. And um, and so it looks like a great, great, well-done movie. Kelsey Grammer's a great actor, and and the parts that I've seen where he plays Chuck Smith, the emotion he shows is truly, truly good. I mean, I'm just really impressed with what I've seen of it so far. Of course, I might get it and think, oh my gosh, I can't believe they said this, or I can't believe they did. You know, that's how it is always, you know. And I know they even depict Catherine Kuhlman in the thing, so I don't know if that's going to be positive or negative, you know. Um, so I don't know how they're going to portray her. But nevertheless, you know, it captures a moment of revival. The Jesus movement was without question a true move of God. This spontaneous revival of love and acceptance of a, of a counterculture or a subculture in America that were greatly rejected by much of the church, including Chuck Smith, until God got a hold of his heart. So it made me think about revival, Cameron, and I, I began to pray about it. And this question formed in my mind, which I think is a great question to ponder, and I'll elaborate further as we go, but I'll just state the question, then, you know, let you respond some, and then we'll talk about this a bit. But here's the question that the Lord posed to my mind that I thought would be good for us to discuss. Is revival a thing that we facilitate, or is it something in which we simply participate? In other words, are we the initiators, or are we, are, are we just along for the ride? And I think that's a great question to ask, because I know that there are people that probably adamantly believe that if we pray enough, fast enough, you know, push the right buttons to pull the right levers, revival will occur. And then there are other people that would simply fall back on the sovereignty of God, say God's a sovereign God, and God moves as he wills, when he wills, and we either cooperate or we don't, or we, you know, we find ourselves on one side or the other of this thing. And so this is the question I think it would be good for us maybe to ponder a little bit tonight. 
And before I answer the question, I posed a question at the beginning towards everyone of uh, stating, do we believe in revival? And I think after that opening, it's very clear that we do. We, yes. uh, we have seen <laughs> evidences of it uh, throughout our history, the church history, and even in the Bible, you see revival happen constantly, um, consistently. I mean, if you look through the book of Judges and all the prophets and First King, Second King, First and Second Chronicles, like you'll see stories consistently of how the people's heart grows cold towards God. And then God brings some message, some prophet, and they deliver a message, a miracle is done, a work is performed, and all of a sudden, everyone turns back to God. And they see that he is God over Israel, and he is their provider, their protector. He is the one who created the heavens and the earth. And so I think it's a very biblical thing to say that we the revival is consistent throughout the Bible. And it's, we've seen it throughout the history uh in America and throughout the Christian church. Um, and then to answer your question, I think it's a very difficult question because you could easily answer one or the other very flippantly without considering all the perspectives. Right. Because I would say definitely that without a doubt, the main um, necessity of having a move of God is having God. Um, because without God, you're not having, you're just moving on your own and just looking right. weird. Yeah. Um, and there have been many people who have tried to make a move of God happen and they just are weird because God wasn't right. in it. However, right. if we didn't believe that God responds to his people crying out, praying, then why would we ever pray? Why would we ever pray for provision to happen, for our families to get saved, for healing to occur? Why would we ever believe in the power of prayer if we didn't believe that our actions make any sort of difference in God's plan or design. And that's even why when we get into different theologies that um, state that God uh, has already planned everything out from beginning to end, and there is no option to change things, and we have no free will, that you and I just tend to differ from that belief. Because right. if there is no free will, then why would we ever pray for God to move or exactly. to change? And we even see in, uh, I want to say it's in Exodus, where God's ready to wipe out the children of Israel, and Moses says, don't do it, because then other country or other nations will say that you couldn't do it. And he reminds God of his promises, right. and pretty much was like, you said, and it says that God repented. Well, right. obviously, God can't sin, so what does that mean? Well, repentance means to turn away or to change like your view. And so it's yeah. just saying God changed his mind. Right. So how can God do that if he's already perfectly planned? That doesn't mean God didn't know he was going to change his mind. Right. But it allowed that free will of Moses to interact. And so all that to say, I think it's a very yes to that question of, yeah. is it this or that? And it's a very yes. Do I think, in my opinion, that God has a lot more to do with it? Absolutely. Because I think there's been many times where people have prayed and prayed and longed and tried to get out ahead of God and activate revival. And it's just not going to happen because right. God's going to do things in his season and in his time. Um, I mean, it's in the book of, uh, oh gosh, what is it? Um, is it Ecclesiastes where it says, uh, uh, there's a season for everything under the sun. Right. And we see that consistently throughout the Bible and through church history and just our own walk with God. There are times where God is doing something very active and, powerful in our lives. And then there's other times where it's time for us to just cultivate the disciplines that we're being taught. Are we maintaining reading the Bible, even when we don't feel that same fire? Are we maintaining going to church, giving, and being faithful to share the gospel? Are we continuing to be devout believers, even when it's not easy and the Spirit's right. just carrying you through every moment of every day? Yeah, And so... Um, just to open it up a little of talking about yeah. it, I think it's going to be a very much a yes answer of yeah. it requires both. Yeah. Um, but I think oftentimes people try to look for an exact formula in right. starting a revival because you, but you'll find when researching and looking through different moves of God, there's no exact formula. You might see like, well, there was a powerful charismatic leader that really led the charge here. Okay. And what about the next one? Well, it was a group of people that decided that they were just going to keep praying and praying and honor God. Okay. And then they Asbury revival. What was it? Someone decided to host a chapel and all of a sudden it like blew up. It's like, okay, so these are very different things and yeah. very different times that God decides to show up. But nonetheless, 
it required some effort of people to facilitate and yeah. to move it. Because if we were just participating when God shows up, who's going to drive it? Who's going to continue to move it? If all of a sudden everyone at that chapel had just decided, wow, that was a great time with God. Okay, let's end it. No, yeah. someone had to pick up that baton and be like, let's keep this going. Let's see where God takes this. Yeah, you know, the Bible says, quench not the spirit, which the implication is we can. So it makes you wonder how many times in history did God want to move, but couldn't find a people through whom he could move. I, I do believe revival is a sovereign act that we help to participate in and facilitate. So like you said, I think it's a yes and yes. Um, I do think revival is a sovereign act of God, meaning that we cannot create revival in and of ourselves. But I do think that God has a plan and that God wants, I believe God is always moving. The question is, are we moving with him? I like what one person said, there's just been one move of God from the beginning of time and people have been jumping on and off of it. And I think there's a lot of truth there. But I do think that sometimes we, because you and I believe very strongly, for example, in the free will aspect of our participation with God, people might think we don't believe in the sovereignty of God. But I do think revival is very much a part of the sovereignty of God. For example, Jesus came at an appointed time. In fact, in the Bible, there's these appointed times called moeds, which means it's an appointed time. For example, the second coming is a, a, a moed. You're not going to, I've heard people say, well, we need to hasten the day. Well, that's a misunderstanding of a King James translate. You're not going to do anything to make Jesus come one second sooner than God has determined he will come. And Jesus talked about a day and an hour. He did not know about what that day and hour was in his lifetime, but it was a pre-appointed time. And there are some things that are simply pre-appointed on God's calendar, and we're not going to we're not going to change it. We're not going to budget in our own lives. There are some things that God's not going to do in and through us until he's ready to do it. Does some of that have to do with us and our character development? Probably. But some things are also appointed times because God's been around a lot longer than us. God knows the end from the beginning, and he has a plan. And I think sometimes we think we're the script writers. We're not. We're participators with God. We're partners together. I think that's a good way to put it. We're partners together with God. So we partner together with him in revival, but the revival is God's idea. And, and we are participants with him in that. But to go back to what you said earlier about if, if, you know, if man, if there is no free will, then why even pray? That's a great point. In fact, the Bible says, I want to read a scripture here in, in Ezekiel in a moment that I always share when I'm talking about the importance of prayer and our role in it. But, you know, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, whenever I teach on prayer, I usually open with that verse. The Bible says, um, this is confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know we have the petitions we've desired of him. So we're to pray in line with the will of God so the will of God can be done. But at the same time, the implication is it's when we pray in line with the will of God that the will of God is done. And we know that since we're praying in line with his will, which of course the word of God is a revelation of the will of God, but then there might be times where God's speaking to you about something. So you're praying in line with what you know to be the will of God for you. And he ultimately brings it to pass. But, but there's a great verse here in Ezekiel 22, verses 29 through 31. And I want to read this because it's a time when God is speaking to Ezekiel, the prophet, about judgment that he's going to bring on the land because of the sins of the people. But he doesn't want to. But being a just God, his justice cannot sleep forever, right? So listen to this passage. This is amazing. Ezekiel 22, 29 through 31. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy and they wrongly oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. This is obviously a picture of intercession, right? That I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord. So in other words, he said, I look for someone to partner together with me in the earth to pray and cry out for mercy, so that my judgment would not fall on the people, but no one would stand in the gap. But as a result of that, being a just God, I had to let my justice fall. It's an amazing thing because you think about, as you said, Moses, who stood in the gap on behalf of the nation, when God at one point literally told him, get out of the way and I'll start a new nation over with you. And we'll just reboot this thing, Moses, right here and now. And Moses said, listen, if you do that, as you said, all the nations will say, see, God couldn't do it. And and God relented, repented, it says in the old King James. But like you said, it, he changed his mind. Now, that doesn't mean that God did not know Moses would stand in the gap. God is a sovereign God. God knows the end from the beginning. But still, it shows the role we have to play. God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham gets in his face in Exodus chapter, what is it? Um, gosh, 18. Or Genesis, Genesis, I'm sorry, Genesis yeah. chapter 18. 
And there's this dialogue, and he says, well, if there's 50 righteous, will you spare it? God said, yeah. And then will you spare it for 40? Will you spare it for 30? He gets all the way down to 10 because he figured lot bounds I have 10 people in his Bible study. And um, God said, yeah, I'll spare it just for 10 righteous. And of course, we know that there were not 10 righteous in Sodom, uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah, but God did spare Lot, which was the really the end goal of Abraham's prayer anyways, to save his nephew. And so we partner together with God, whatever we bind is bound, whatever we loose is loosed, right? And he's talking about the realm of authority in that. So we have a role to play, but I, but there's still a sovereign side to revival. We see that, like we said, with the birth of Jesus. Then 50 days later is the outpouring of Pentecost. The people were praying, yes, in the upper room, but did their prayers bring it? I would say no. What their prayers did, or I would use it this way, God planned the revival. God used their prayers to help facilitate it and also to sensitize them to it. So you have God who wants to do something in the earth, but needs a people he can work through. God's always worked through people. God worked through Adam and Eve, and when they betrayed him, he had to find another partner in the earth, right? Someone that would give him access and entrance into the earth, because he gave dominion of the earth to Adam and Eve. They turned it over to the enemy, who became the god of this world, the world system, not the planet, but the world system. And so he needed another entree. So he makes a covenant with Abraham, begins to work through Abraham, and then Abraham's descendants, and then, of course, then the church, right? And so God's always looking for a people through whom he works. We, call, we say all the time, the church are his hands are in, and his feet. Is that just a metaphor, or do we literally mean that we are the representatives? We say that all the time, representatives of God, ambassadors for Christ. God uses the church to carry out his will, right, in the earth. So you're right. I think it's a, a both-and answer, but I think we can overemphasize one part or the other to the exclusion of the other side of it and, and make error, because we're not going to create revival in and of ourselves, nor is God going to work independent of the church, because it's a partnership that he established. And I think one of the things that uh, you mentioned that I find really important is the fact that how you said, like, God needs people. And as you see, you need, he needs people to stand in that gap. Um, one of my favorite passages out of the Bible that every time I hear it, my soul, my heart, every part of me just lights up and be, and just relates to uh, wanting to be that person is in the book of Isaiah. And it's when Isaiah is standing before the court, uh, the throne room of God in the heavenly courtroom, and they're saying, who will like go out and speak to the nations? Who will rise up for their king? And Isaiah like cries out, like, here am I, send me. Yeah. Because at some point, God needs some person, some people to be willing to say, here am I, send me, here am I, use me. And I think one of the most beautiful things you see throughout the Bible is not like these wonderfully talented people, these intelligent people, these people that were just gifted or rich or whatever. It's people that were willing and they have that willing heart. And I think oftentimes when God moves, it's because he found a people that was willing. He found a group that was willing and had been maybe praying, had been desirous, had been, and like, Yes, these things can be added, but oftentimes God just needs someone who's willing. And I'm not saying like all of a sudden after everyone right now says, hey, I am willing, there's going to be a revival or an outpouring. Right. But with that willing heart often comes this expectation for God to respond. And I think that's one of the things that we see God respond to is a certain level of expectancy. Um, and we see this in different, like, let's say someone has a healing meeting or there's a service for a healing meeting. When people are like, ah, I don't think God's going to show up. Oftentimes, yeah, that service goes by and it's dull and it's boring. But when you see people coming out of the woodwork, taking vacation days, setting aside time, and they're like, I have an expectancy that God yeah. is going to show up. Well, what happens? Normally, God shows up. I mean, we look at, let's go back to a different revival with A.A. A. Allen, where there's a lot of healing revival happening. Um for example, I don't necessarily agree with all of A.A. A. Allen's theology. I don't right. agree with everything he did. However, in those meetings, God didn't need someone perfect. He needs someone willing. He was willing. And as those healings started happening, what happened? People were bringing people from hospitals on stretchers. That's expectancy. As a doctor, you don't tell your patient, hey, I'm going to wheel you out into a tent across town. And it's going to be a little bumpy as we're going across the rough ground, but you're going to be fine. You can't move anyways. And that guy's going to pray for you and you're going to be healed. No, you don't expect that if it's like, well, hopefully like 
it's it's a shot in the dark. No, it's a level of expectancy that you're setting. And God responds to that. Yeah. He moves in that. And I mean, we see this in church all the time with something as simple as worship. When you see that people are into worship, are expecting to receive from God, and all of a sudden that worship service all of a sudden becomes a lot more. It feels like you can feel the presence of God in that room. And I mean, the Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. Yeah. When we are of one heart, one mind with Christ and are expecting him to show up, he does move in that. And so I think that's another thing that affects whether or not revival takes off. Is there that willingness met with that expectation right. that God's going to be able to move? I, I think what the Lord was saying to me when when I was driving home, and like I said, a lot of these thoughts, like I said, things just began tumbling forth in my mind like they do when you're ready to prepare a message and God's just giving you you know one verse after another one thought after another and one of the things I felt like the Lord was kind of communicating to me is that the move of God nationally regionally globally whenever there's a move of God of any size is not unlike moving and cooperating with the Holy Spirit in a local church mm -hmm. first Corinthians 14 gives guidelines for the operation of the gifts of the Spirit in a local church but Paul's dissertation on the gifts really starts in first Corinthians chapter 12. 12, 13, and 14, we call love the uh, chapter 13, the love. But if you look at it, it's not a love chapter. It's really talking about love being the primary motivation for the gifts. So really 12, 13, 14, Paul's responding to questions about the gifts of the Spirit and the move of the Holy Ghost. And one of the things he says in that first verse that I've taught on more times than I have fingers and toes and you, you and me together and all the people listening to us have fingers and toes for is 1 Corinthians 12, 1. And here it says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now we lose that because of, you know, we say sometimes it gets lost in translation. And this is a, a verse where that happens. If you're reading, a, you know, a, a formal equivalency translation like New King James, King James, New American Standard, you notice that word gifts is italicized, meaning that it was added by the translators, hopefully uh, to provide some clarity. And it's not a it's not a bad translation, but it misses the mark a little bit because really the word um, spiritual gifts is not in that verse. The word spiritual there is actually plural, spirituals, and it's not the Greek word charis or charisma that we see, for example, in 1 Corinthians 14 or 12, uh, 4, you know, where it says now there are diversities of gifts with the same spirit. That word charisma is the word that we typically associate with the gifts of the spirit. It's the Greek word charis or charisma means grace or gift. It's this instead is the Greek word pneumaticos. Now, pneuma is the Greek word for spirit. And if you look up that word in W.E. Vine's uh, expository dictionary of New Testament words, the word pneumaticos, it will say it connotes the ideas of invisibility and power. Well, just, just like the wind. The word pneuma in the Greek means spirit, but also translated wind or breath. And so you think about the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can see its effects and feel its influence. If my wife says, Randy, is the wind blowing because she wants to know whether she needs a jacket to go out in the weather or not, I don't go and say, yeah, man, I can see a wind out there because you can't see the wind. What I do is I look to the tops of the trees or to see if anything's blowing down the street because we can see what the wind is influencing or affecting. We just can't see the wind. And and likewise, that's that's what Paul begins to talk about concerning the Holy Spirit, who is like the breath or the wind. I don't want you to be ignorant. Now, you can't control the wind. If you're on a sailboat in the middle of the lake, you can't make the wind blow, but what you can do is set your sail to catch the wind that is blowing. You can't tell the wind which direction to blow. You can't tell it how hard to blow, but what you can do is cooperate with the wind that you're given. And I think, you know, for example, in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 11 here, it says, but one of the same spirit works all these things, talking about the different gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So there's a sovereign side of this. God's going to use whom he wills, now, we believe God's always moving, whether it's through the preaching or through the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit, God's always moving. But the question is, are we catching the wind? I've been in services, Cameron, you and I have talked about this before, where maybe one night you have the joy of the Lord showed up. And I, I've seen people laughing hysterically under the joy of the Lord, God breaking yokes of bondage off of them, getting healed by the power of God. And then the next night, he wants them to do something else. But people like what he did the night before, so they're trying to push the service. It's like trying to direct the wind. You can't do that. What you need to do instead is say, which way is this wind blowing? Which way is the Holy Ghost wanting to go? And then harness that and flow with him. There have been times, Cameron, when I got in the pulpit, and I thought I knew what I was going to preach when I got in there. But as soon as I got up there, I realized this ain't it. And so what I did is just step back and say, Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? I'll never forget. I'll give you a good example. 
I was in Eureka, California. I've told this story many times before. And and I felt like I got an idea of what the Lord wanted to do, but I didn't really spend a lot of time in prayer. You know, you're just used to doing this all the time. And so it'll be good. We'll, we'll go. I got a great message, you know, and this is in my early traveling days before I'd learned as much as I know now. And I still don't know a lot, but we're learning every day. Um, and I thought I had a good idea what God wanted to do. So I got up and really what it was is I had this message as I was going to preach. And I get behind the pulpit, and this is in the days where, you know, today I can flow out of my heart pretty good. I don't have to have a whole lot of preparation. you got a wealth of, you know, uh, a reservoir, you know, of knowledge and stuff you've shared before. So it didn't take a lot, you know, to come up with something. But back then, I didn't have as much. And all of a sudden, I got that pulpit, and I realized there's no anointing on this message. I mean, I didn't even have to start it. I could just tell the wind is dead. There's nothing blowing this message. So I started to preach it because that's all I got, you know, such as I have, give by thee, and I ain't got nothing else. So I tried to preach that message. It, it died. It, the, the stink of the message was becoming more profound the, the further I went. And the people weren't aware of it yet, but I was aware of how dead it was. So I said, hey, let's all just lift our hands and worship the Lord for a moment. And I know they're all thinking, oh, man, Brother Randy's probably getting a word of knowledge. He's probably seeing something in the realm of the Spirit. No, I was just desperate to hear from God because I didn't have anything. And so I said, Lord, what do you want to do? And I, I, at that point, I couldn't hear anything. I was so apprehensive and anxious because these people really loved our ministry. And they just thought, man, this is going to be a great revival. I was going to be there for three days, two services a day. They're ready for a move of God. And I'm terrified. I don't, what am I going to do? I don't, I've got the wrong message. So I tried to launch back into my message. It was worse the second time than it was the first. So about five more minutes into that, I said, let's all just lift our hands. They could see that I'm searching for something. So I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I heard the Spirit of God. He threw me a, a lifeline. I heard the Spirit of God say, have a healing line. Have a healing line. Lord, don't you know our healing meeting is scheduled for the night, uh, for the third night. If we have a healing service tonight, what are we going to do then? And as Lester Summerall said, God didn't reply. Why? Because God never replies to stupidity. And so I, I knew I only got one thing to do. And I said, if you have, man, I, I don't care if people got a hangnail. If you got anything, if you need, an, if you have a need, physical need in your body, you get up here right now. The moment people began to respond to that and come forward, I laid my hands on people and the power of God, boom, was there. Why? Because we started flowing in the direction the wind was blowing, started flowing in the direction the Spirit of God wanted to go. So I couldn't control the wind, but I could cooperate with it. Now, the amazing thing was once we got, got that flow, all of a sudden God restored to me what he wanted to share that night. And after we had a quick healing line, I, I preached like a house of fire. But what those people didn't know was I was trying to go in the wrong direction initially. And so I think revival is like that. We can't make God do what he did last night. We can't make God do another, um, you know, Azusa Street revival. We can't make God do another healing revival. Now, healing is always a truth, right? The move of the Holy Spirit is always a truth. But you can't say, God, we want a revival that emphasizes A, B, and C. What we can do is say, Lord, we know you want to move, and we want to be a people ready to follow you. And our hearts are crying out and hungry for you to move in any way that you want to. I believe any church can have revival locally, by, and by that I mean we can, they can have a vital move of God's Spirit by simply being sensitive to the Spirit of God. But I think when God does something on a national level, again, it comes to this. Number one, I believe there are times where God sovereignly wants to move, to restore something, to bring life back to the church, to touch a hurting world. And what we can do is be sensitive to the Spirit of God, catch that wind, and what's sad, Cameron, you and I have seen this, we've talked about this historically, oftentimes the people that miss the revival are the people that were headlining the last revival. And the reason why that is, is because it doesn't look like what they think revival should look like, because they've got this framework in their mind of what God did last time, and that's what revival looks like. That's why the Bible said, forget the former, uh, for, uh, you know, forget not, uh, what, oh, I'm sorry, let me, I'm going to read this first. I'm misquoting it here, but let me just read it. Um, in Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. It says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it <laughs> shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Well, that's what you don't have in the wilderness is a road. What you don't have in a desert is a, a river. What he's saying is, is as I begin to do a new thing and you cooperate with it, I will make a way in the wilderness. I will make rivers in the desert. In other words, I'll do something in a dry season as you follow me, as you flow with me. And, and what happens is when we begin to cooperate with God in a dry season, it begins to create a highway for God's people to follow on. It creates refreshing waters for people to, to sample. But he needs people, leaders. It can be a, a leader. It can be a number of leaders. It can be a group of people, like you said. 
that are just hungry for God and cry out to him, God begins to respond, God begins to move, and other people uh, come to those thirsting waters. And the thing is, it's the thirsty. You know, the Bible says, I'll satisfy the longing soul and fill the hungry soul with good. It's the hungry and thirsty who receive from these waters of revival, not just the people who are the old timers with God. Um, that's why we always need to keep ourselves humble and fresh and current with God, because he might be doing something very distinct and different than what we saw him do before. And we can miss the boat by saying, well, that's not revival. That's not the way revival looks. When we had a revival, it looked like this. Well, this, this isn't then. This is now. And God may be doing something new. It's still the Holy Spirit. It's still godly and kingdom building, but it's just in a different mode and method, maybe using different people, completely different style, different music. These are the things that ruffle people's feathers because we can get a religious spirit and kind of, I don't know, want to memorialize the way God did things in days gone by and miss what he's doing now. I think we're often our own greatest impediment um, yeah. in life and to the move of God. And I think especially when it comes to things concerning God, I think as humans, we have a tendency to want control. We like control because when we can control things, it's comfortable, it's familiar. And you've worked so hard to learn something one way, you just want to be able to do it that way every time. However, God is not a circus animal that we get to put on display and say, dance, monkey, dance. He is God. I think a, a better analogy would be if any of you have ever been wakeboarding and you're on that board and you're holding the string, you're not moving that boat. If you get knocked down, you can't pull yourself back up. No, that rope gets yanked out of your hand because why? You're not stronger than a boat. You don't have more power than that motor. Right. You're not going to be able to move God. Why? Because you're not more powerful than him. You're not in control. And if you were, would that be a God worth serving and worshiping? No, God is a powerful God who does amazing things. And he can do things the way he's done it before. And I think of it as an example of, would you want to eat a hamburger every single day for the rest of your life? No, of course not. That'd be boring and monotonous. Does that mean you might have hamburgers multiple times in your life? Sure, they're great. But God's not going to do the same thing the same way every single time. One reason being because he doesn't have to, and he's a God of creativity, of yeah. art, and of beauty. And if things are done the same way, trust me, I'm someone who is an OCD individual. I like repetition in a lot of different aspects of working because it's predictable. However, I also understand it gets boring and you burn out if you do things the same way every time. And yeah. then two, how are you going to relate to the other people in the world if you're doing things that only appeal to a certain aspect of people? I mean, we talk about it all the time. If you were to go fishing, you wouldn't use the same bait for every fish. Why would you do the same thing for every person? There's a reason we have different types of churches, and that's not a bad thing. Some people like a more liturgical service that has the standing, sitting, reciting of different creeds and important things. Some people love inspirational worship and free form messages and sermons. And so we have to be used to, and we have to get accustomed to, giving up control in every area of our spiritual lives when it comes to surrendering to God. Because yes, there's a lot of things that are great in discipline and routine and building, but if God asks you to go somewhere else, that's the issue that the Pharisees often had is that they were stuck in their religious systems, their processes, their so-called disciplines that they thought that they knew what was best, but they missed when God was doing something because it wasn't in the package that they had been used to, that they had been told it was going to be. Right. And oftentimes God is not going to be doing things in the package that we think it's going to be. And we can miss what God is going to do by trying to do it our way or the way we've seen it done before. And I think that when it comes to humility, I think that's something that we could preach on for days and days. Um, it's so important to grasp humility. Um, I think in this season of my life, and I've shared it on this podcast, that God has been more than anything just humbling me in this season continually again and again and again. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, I think that we continually need to be humbled in order to really surrender to God. Because when we start thinking of ourselves, I have accomplished this. I have done this. It's like how we shared a couple of weeks ago. It was with Nebuchadnezzar who said, look at this vast glory and what I have brought. Right. 
and then he was humbled to the lowest. We miss out on what God can really do. And we miss out on him in our life when we start replacing him with ourselves. Um, and I think the attitude we should have, oh gosh, I want to say, was it Kenneth Hagan that made the comment of, I want to be, I don't want to be, how did he phrase it? Of, I want to be where God is going to move, not where he has moved. It was something along those lines. I can't remember the exact quote. I'd have to look it up. But the idea was that he always wanted to be where God was going to be moving, even if that meant losing everything else and being and following God. And I think that's the way we should be is where are we looking to be? We want to be in the next move of God, not still living in the last move of God. We want to be responding to what God's speaking to our hearts currently, not what he was five years ago. Yeah. If we're not continually growing and moving forward, we're going to miss out on where God wants to bring us. I think oftentimes we can get stuck in the rut of yesterday and not realize that God's calling us to something new. And the reason might be because he's ready for a move of God and he wants you on that, or he's ready to do something powerful and he needs you to move forward and not stay in what was comfortable. I mean, we always give I think the church in general gives Peter grief in talking about how he was the one that like sank in the water, but he was also the only one that even questioned, Lord, can I come out to you? Yeah. He was the only one yeah. that stepped out of the right. boat. No one thought to ask the question, hey, if it's you, let me step out. He was the first one that thought of it and was like, hey, if it is you, let me step out. Let me do it. Let me come to you. And I think that's the attitude we need to have. And sometimes, yeah, we might sink but God's going to be there to get us. He was there to get Peter. He's not going to forget about us. So I think it's, uh, we need to be careful not to be our own impediment when it comes to the moves of God yeah. and what he's trying to do. Yeah, there's a passage of scripture that really covers exactly what you're talking about. Jesus is being questioned by both the Pharisees, which I think sometimes we forget the Pharisees at one point were a move of God. They, they were people that were endeavoring to preserve uh, Israel's history and traditions and scriptures and their devotion to God. And they got legalistic, which happens um, once the life has gone out of a move of God, all you have are the rules left. And then there was the disciples of John who were in the most recent revival before Jesus, right? Because John preceded Jesus. And so these two groups that represent what God did are coming to the disciples in Jesus about what God is doing. I want to read this passage of scripture, and then I'll explain exactly some of the things you're talking about, like from, from this perspective here. And this is in Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 33. It says, Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, those are the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And he said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. Then here's the analogies that he uses. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one, otherwise the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. Now, the first question I have every time I read this passage of Scripture is, why are there still disciples of John? John was pointing to what God was going to do. And then Jesus arrived, and John points and says, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John said, I must decrease so that he must increase. And so a couple of disciples, when they hear him say, hey, there is the Lamb of God, they leave John and say, hey, it's been great being a part of the John the Baptist Evangelistic Association, uh, but the new thing's in town, and we're going to flow with what God is doing now. And they go and talk to Jesus, where are you staying? And they stay with him that evening. And from then on, they become the disciples of Jesus, and others begin to recognize. And why did Jesus pick fishermen? Why didn't he go to the Pharisees? Why didn't he go to all the disciples of John? Because they're already stuck in a certain form of revival that they recognize and have embraced, and they're used to that. He needs people who are not pre-committed to a certain form of revival that they can't cut loose of. So he goes and finds these people who to whom he is a fresh voice. So anyway, Jesus, one of the analogies he uses is you can't put new wine into old wineskins. Now let's let's break down this analogy. What, what in the world is this talking about? Well, I think if you go far enough back, we understand that wineskins are just that. They're skins, animal skins made out of leather that wine was put into. Well, when you put grape juice, which becomes wine, into bottles over the process of time that begins to ferment. And as it begins to ferment, it begins to expand those bottles. 
And so those wineskins would begin to bloat. Now, I used to work in a restaurant, Cameron, and it was not uncommon that when ketchup, because it's made out of tomato, when it would begin to ferment, all of a sudden you hear a pop and a, and a ketchup bottle would burst because that fermentation expanded the ketchup bottle beyond what it was able to expand. Well, the same thing would happen with these wineskins, but they have give in them, right? So these wineskins would begin to expand. And the thing was, no wineskin was shaped exactly like another because they would have weak spots in the, you know, uh, in the skin where maybe a bubble would pop out here or a bubble would pop out there. And in the and they would take the shape of the wine. Behold, I show you a parable. So the wine representing the move of the Spirit of God, it would shape that form, that group of people, if you will. But the wineskin would form that wineskin in a very unique and distinctive way. Now, what happens over the process of time, though, is that wine is slowly being poured out. And the but what happens after a while, you have the form and also that that wine skin gets hard and brittle over time. The moistness of it leaves, you know, it's now it's older, you know, like old skin gets, you know, more firm. And so, I, so you have this firm, rigid form, but the wine is gone. And what Jesus is saying is if you put new wine in that, that already pre-shaped, predetermined shape of a previous revival, when that new wine begins to expand, it'll burst because now it's hard and brittle and shaped in a very particular way. And the wine is lost and you've lost the old form too. So both are, it's like when somebody tries to bring, you know, like revival to an old stayed church that's used to only one and then the church splits, right? And and people think, oh, they just could get on with the move of God. Yeah, but in a way you, you ruined that wineskin because they weren't prepared for that. And it might be something God is endeavoring to do, but if the people aren't receptive and responsive, you can't just try to bring new wine into an old wineskin. That's also wrong. I've been in situations where I was in churches where I realized I just need to follow and help the people the best I can, but I can't necessarily, I'm not here to change your theology. I'm not here to upend this pastor's vision for the church. So you have to cooperate and give them what you can, maybe give them a little here, give them a little there so that they start to, I guess you could say, reshape themselves. Now, here's the cool thing. Those wineskins could be renewed. And that word new could also mean renew. So what they would do is they take those old wineskins and submerge them in water and then rub them with oil, which is also a type of the Holy Spirit, right? And they would become pliable again. Then you could put new wine in them again. So what we have a lot of times are denominations, churches that have a certain form, ritual, style of music, liturgy that was shaped by a prior move of God. Almost every denomination was shaped by some prior move of God, whether it's Baptist, Lutheran, whatever, right? All shaped by a prior move of God. What happened over time, though, the Spirit of God began to move out and do something different. And all you got now is the dry form without really a vital presence of the spirit or the anointing upon it. And so that's what we have a lot of times. And, and it's not that there's necessarily anything wrong with some of the traditions that people are holding to, but the problem is they're not open to anything fresh that the spirit of God is endeavoring to do because they're, you know, they're defending the old guard. They're, they're staying true to the old shape, the old. And, and the thing is God's ever moving on. I don't mean, I don't think it's, I don't mean that theology is changing, but the expression of the way God moves in, a, in one generation from another is different depending on what he wants to emphasize, depending on what his purpose for that revival is. If you look at the Jesus movement, it's completely different than the old Pentecostal revival of Azusa Street, completely different. In Azusa, it was very much structured on holiness because it came out of the old holiness denominations like the Nazarene and the Methodist, especially affected by the John Wesley revivals and so forth. And then the Jesus movement comes along and it's kind of a free love, you know, just, you know, lovey-dovey and people are like hippies and, you know, it's not super structured and the old pen time Pentecostals have been rolling in their grave to see that. But at the same time, it was definitely a move of God. It was just different. And God was, again, using imperfect people. So people say, well, it can't be God because this happened and that happened. Well, of course it's God. It was God when he was, God came on Samson, even when he was doing horrible, terrible things with his lifestyle. That doesn't mean God was endorsing the wrong. It just means that God uses imperfect people. And, you know, I mentioned earlier about Lonnie Frisbee that was used in that uh, great revival in the Jesus movement. And I don't want to get too much into this because I think God used him in a mighty way. But but I think the movie even brings out the fact, because I, I Googled him. I, I, had, I had heard the name before, but I didn't know much about him. He struggled. He had his own struggles in his own life, just like we all do. And God uses imperfect people. There's no doubt God used him to spark that Jesus movement. But at the same time, he struggled with his own issues. And so I think we just have to give grace to the realization that oftentimes revival is almost always messy. It almost always, just like a rushing river, spills out of its bounds. 
There's always excess. I like what Donald G said. I'd rather have a little excess and fanaticism and have God moving than have the order of a graveyard and have nothing happening. And I think sometimes people want it one way or the other. And what we want to do to the best of our ability is keep within biblical parameters, but still allow the spirit, the freedom to do what he wants to do and bring a fresh expression of his presence to our generation, to our church, to our movement, whatever, and let him determine the way he's going to move, the direction he's going to move, the speed in which he's going to move, and let's just, you know, cooperate with him and flow with him. And I just, I remembered uh, when you were talking the expression that I had heard uh, that Kenneth Hagen said, and it, I think it's Kenneth Hagen, like I said, but he was asked, like, if there's ever, a, uh, if you're ever wondering where I am and there's a move of the, like, uh, Holy Spirit going on, I'm going to be right in the middle of it. Yeah. And I think that's the attitude we should have is that we want to be right in the middle of it. And because we've heard about so many, and I think it's one of the things in Christianity um, I mean, my whole life, I grew, I mean, I grew up at the end of, I would say, some of the movements of the Holy Spirit, yeah. where um, I didn't really see as many healings happen. I didn't see as many people falling under the power. I didn't see a lot of those things. And in some regards, like, growing up and hearing about it my whole life, I was like, man, I just missed it, man. I like, I want to see that happen. I want to see it happen. I want to see it occur. And I spent so much time looking so hard for that move to come back that I often wonder how much I missed because God was trying to do something else in my life or right. trying to do something else. Right. And I say this because I don't want anyone out there hearing this, thinking that we're just trying to harsh on anyone who's had this mindset. Cause I've been that right. same way. It's right. very easy to be like, you hear about a great thing happening. And I, I think today it's more referenced as FOMO and it's fear of missing out. You don't mm. want to be that person that missed out on this great thing that came out. You don't mm. want to be the one person that doesn't have an iPhone in a group chat because then you're making <laughs> it green. You don't want to be that person. And it's always this, you want to fit in. You want to see these, and especially when it comes to Christianity where God is the most central thing to our lives and being in the presence of God is one of the most amazing things. And when people talk about this amazing move and you just wanted to be a part of it, you start looking so hard in the rear view mirror and looking back. And anytime there's been moves of God, the enemy has been right alongside to create imitations of it and right. all things going on. And I think if we spend our life looking back, we end up like Lot's wife and yeah. We just get frozen where we are because we're looking, we're looking and the devil will be willing to offer all these distractions and sure it is a great thing of God at one point, but the devil's willing to take your attention away from God, what God's trying to do now and have you keep looking. And I know there've been many times in my life where I was like, I just want to see that move of God. I want to experience what other people talked about instead of looking forward to what God's doing. And now in my life, I look at it as a great opportunity that I've never been so I haven't gone through a move of God my on my own, like of a, uh, a revival as we'd call it. And so when it happens, I don't have any expectations of what it should look like, what it should sound like. And I think that anyone who has been one has been through one should have the same mindset as me. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what it's going to sound like. We don't know what God's going to do. We see revivals where God was healing a lot of people. We see revivals where God was doing a lot of miracles. We see revivals where it was just more uh, a joy movement or a teaching movement. No. We don't know what God is going to do. And trying to put an infinite God in a box and try to predict what he's going to do is more futile than people trying to predict what the stock market's going to do. Yeah, you can't exactly. predict what God's going to do. But we know whatever he's going to do, it's good. So why would we fight it? Yeah. If we know that God's going to bring a great gift and something beautiful, why fight it? Why try to predict it? Why try to control it? Just follow him. And when it does show up, be willing to be right in the middle of it. You know, I think one of the reasons why, Cameron, is people become successful and find roles, positions, offices of influence in the last thing he did. And sometimes embracing the new thing might mean risking losing that status or position. You know, I was watching one of the episodes of The Chosen the other day, and how the Pharisees were plotting on, you know, taking Jesus down and even taking out some of the Pharisees that were kind of supportive of him, that kind of thing, you know, like, and there's all these power struggles that go on in the church, and and people want to be right in my denomination versus your denomination. And when, you, when you're committed to those kinds of temporal things, and you've hooked your wagon to that star, if you will, 
then you're really not hooked to Jesus, are you? You're hooked to an institution, an organization, a, a particular leadership phase or style, which means that you're not as wholly committed to just wherever the Lord. That's why I, uh, I guess I'm not a believer, a big believer in denominations. I'm not against them. I think God has used them. I just don't think he ever created one. What God did was move. And then people like Peter on the mountaintop wanted to build a tent around it. And so they built structure and form and because we're going to preserve this thing. And so we're going to put people in positions of authority to make sure everybody knows what the rules of the revival are, right? And then the wineskin goes empty. And so they still have the form structure and all that kind of thing. I've seen good men wasted in administrative positions. They should have been out preaching the gospel. You know, instead they were a superintendent of something. And it's like, show me the office of superintendent in the Bible. I'm sorry, just some of these things, these structure stuff, I just think is more man-made. And don't get me wrong, I, I think that structure is good, accountability is good, but the church was able to have it without having, the, and I'm talking about the book of Acts, they were able to have it without, you know, trying to create some kind of man-made. In fact, what's interesting, there's a wonderful book I'd encourage everybody to read called 2,000 Years of Charismatic Church History, I think is the name of it, and it's an amazing book. I can't remember the author's name. I've got it up on the shelf somewhere. The 2,000 Years of Ch Charismatic Church History. And one of the things that we see, people have said, well, you know, why did the miraculous wane after the first century? And some people believe miracles stopped with the apostles. No, they didn't. They went on quite prolifically in the first century, second century, and then you begin to see a diminishing of them as the church became more orchestrated, ecclesiastical, and liturgical, and less responsive to the Spirit of God. As hierarchy, human hierarchy began to develop, and began to put controls on things, you see, actually there was at one point where you can see there was a breach, and God continued to move with the people flowing with him, and yet there became this ecclesiastical thing, which you know later became the church at Rome, that was in kind of counter, uh, kind of opposition, I guess you could say, to that more free-spirited thing. And then you think about times where God tried to bring revival through people like um, um, John Hus, uh, Hus, you know, we'd say John Hus, but John, John Hus, and then later, of course, uh, he did through Martin Luther, but John Hus had this, you know, uh, spark of revival about him. They, they burned him at the stake. They did the same thing with William Tyndale. You can go on and on. When God tried to bring revival through people, but they didn't receive it because it threatened their power structures. And I don't think it's a far stretch, Cameron, to say that that same thing happens today, that when certain denominations are challenged, I know denominations that are still in existence today that one time, you know, led the charge in the move of the Spirit of God, but then they got their structures, they got their security, they you get your 401ks, you get, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm serious, you know, career ministry. And then suddenly you can't just say, sorry, guys, God's doing something over here I'm, because they're not one of us. And if you go over there, we'll pull your papers. And that stuff happens. That's not, you know, fairyland. I know stuff like that. I know, I know denominations, if you're not a member of their group, you can't preach in their churches. Well, who made them another Jesus? You know, who made them another the church? There's either the church or there's no church, but there's not little sub-churches, right? And so these denominations become miniature kingdoms unto themselves. And so when that happens, it divides the church, and it and it creates barriers from people responding to what God is doing in another group because, well, they're not us, so that can't be God. I remember Brother Hagin talking about that when God raised up William Branham, and he came from a completely different background. He was part of the Assembly of God, Brother Hagin was. And they went and saw some miracles that were done through William Branham's ministry. Amazing healings and dramatic things God was doing through him. And, and on the car ride back, Brother Higgins said, I couldn't believe it. These guys were saying, well, that couldn't be the Holy Ghost. He's not assembly of God. And to, to think that anyone could be that, I want to say stupid, but that would be unkind. But to think that anyone, I mean, I don't care what the denomination is. I'm just using that as an example. Baptist, Lutheran, I don't care. It could be my denomination. I don't have one, but you know what I'm saying. It could be whatever. But the point is, is that, or it could be word of faith, whatever. I know people that if you, it's, it's not a Brother Hagen quote, they won't say it. If or you know what I'm saying, it's like the same thing. And and to think, and Brother Hagen won that way. He he fed off a lot of different people. He he loved people all over the church. He would quote Baptist preachers. I mean, you know, we need to seek truth where it's found. We need to, to see the Holy Spirit moving wherever He's moving, even if it's in a completely different way than what we're familiar with. You know, I come from kind of a more buttoned down old, when I came out of Bible college, more buttoned down suit wearing kind of, you know, institution. And yet I would go sometime, I'll never forget going to a Calvary chapel, not a Calvary chapel. It was a vineyard church one time to preach. And the pastor's son saw me and said, dad, the suit's here. And, you know, because they didn't dress like that, you know, and, and I know I would have gone back then I would have gone to a place like that skeptical. Well, why aren't they dressed up? Why aren't, why aren't they showing respect to the Holy ghost? You know, that kind of stuff and miss what God was doing among them. 
And so, I, like I said, I think we just have to be, we have to lower our prejudicial walls. We have to get over ourselves and our egos and our denominational biases and begin to look for God where he's moving. Can I guarantee you when Lonnie Frisbee showed up with those freaks at Chuck Smith's house, <laughs> the last thing he wanted to do is say, yeah, this is what God's doing. You can see it in the trailers for that movie. But he began to recognize God's doing something. And if I don't open my doors to them, God will find some doors to open to them, but I will miss out on the move of God. And so he did, and he did lose some people. He lost money, he lost backing, almost lost his church. But thank God he didn't lose the move of God. And I'll tell you what, if I have to hang with people, the crowd or the cloud, I'm going with the cloud every time. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great place to end. I mean, there's a lot of things I think we could say, but I think that's a great place to end of well, who do you want to be following, the crowd or the cloud? Yeah. Because at the end of our life, we're accountable to one of them. And it's not that's the crowd. Right. That's right. <laughs> That's a good way to say it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, we next week maybe we'll come back to this. I don't know, or some other time because we did, we didn't even talk about you know the some of the primary uh, revivals throughout the 20th century, whether it was you know the revival in Topeka, Kansas under Charles Palmer, the Azusa Street revival, the Healing Revival, Charismatic Renewal, Teaching Revival of the 70s and 80s, um, and and you know question people might have what's God doing today. But one of the things I think is important, Cameron, is one thing we know He's always doing is He's winning souls and making disciples. And one of the things I've tried to do is always go back to the basics. Whenever I get confused, I'll never forget, you know, when Vince Lombardi took over the Green Bay Packers, he is famously, I, I don't think this is an apocryphal story. I think it actually happened. He walked in and held up a football and said, boys, this is a football. It was his way of announcing we're going back to the basics. And I think, you know, we need to always go back to the basics, prayer, seeking God, teaching the word, winning souls, making disciples. You'll always find Jesus doing that. And so if we'll do that, that's a great place to start. And then just see how God is moving and allow him to be God. Let's not try to direct the wind. Let's just try to set our sail to catch it and go whithersoever he wants us to go. Amen. Why don't I uh, close us in prayer yeah. for tonight? Lord, we just thank you that you're an amazing God. Yeah. That you're always constantly moving in our lives and drawing us to your will, plan, and purpose. And we thank you that as we just start meditating on what is revival and where will it take place, that you soften our heart and make our hearts ready for the next one that will happen, for the next move of God, or draw us to where you're calling us to prepare for it, that we just soften our hearts, not looking for what was in the past and the way things have been done before, but just submitting ourselves in humility to hear you, not getting in our own way, but just desiring to follow after what you say, what you ask us to do. We thank you that you're just preparing our minds and our bodies for what's to come and that it's going to be an amazing move yeah. and it's going to be according to you and that you're the one that's going to lead and we will follow. We thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we said, maybe next week we'll do part two and go through some of the revivals, or maybe we'll do that for another time. We'll just do whatever the Spirit of God, whichever way the wind blows, right? Whatever the Spirit of God seems to impress on our hearts at the time. But we do really endeavor just to hear the voice of God. And, you know, let me just say this too. You know, sometimes you don't necessarily have a word from God. You know, I talk about that time in, you know, Eureka Cameron, where I had that message and God, you know, wanted me to do what he wanted, not what I wanted. But a lot of times pastors are just trying to ascertain the mind of God and they don't get a word from God. They just prepare, get a message in their heart and share it and God anoints it. And so, you know, just do what your hand finds to do. Be faithful. Do what you know God's called you to do. And when he wants to do something in particular, he'll let you know. But, you know, it's it, they say it's easier to direct a moving object than try to get a stationary object in motion. So just get in motion doing what you know to do. Be faithful to the word of God. Be faithful to your calling. Uh, be faithful to pray. Seek the face of God. Make disciples. Win souls. And God will use you. So we'll come back next week with something. We don't know. We'll see what the Spirit of God wants to do. But thanks for joining us tonight. Again, go to the website, randylanebunch.org. Under the media link, you'll find all of our resources, blog, podcast, uh, YouTube channel, uh, magazine, a um, lot of good things there, hundreds of hours worth of resources that will be a blessing to your life. So God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us tonight, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.